one of the campaigns that EDA has been very actively involved with, and we're going to go back to probably June of 2013, is we've been involved in opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and that is on our October letter. Um, basically, there's kind of an agreement on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which means we could sometime in 2016 possibly see a vote. And so we wanted to make sure that the members here know that we are looking for a no vote on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There is no one in this country that knows more about good trade deals versus bad trade deals than Lori Wallach, founder and director of Global Trade Watch at Public Citizen. So we are very pleased and thrilled that Lori has taken time out of her really busy schedule to come and give us an update on what is going on with this incredibly toxic trade deal and possibly its evil siblings, TTIP and TISA. So Lori Wallach, welcome. Well, wow. first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, and it's an honor to be here with all of you. PDA has done great work on fair trade for so long, and so even though I sound a little bit like Greta Garbo, I'm probably not contagious. I, did, I was out from work a couple days, but I dragged myself together and said I'm not going to miss having the chance to talk to PDA of all people, because you guys do such great stuff. So um, I'm probably huggable, not kissable, and probably not contagious. Okay, so... The, the, T, the, T, the TPP, and hopefully my voice lasts through here. So, you know, a lot of you were involved in making it such that it was really hard to make a TPP deal. And that's kudos to actually not just all of the great grassroots activists in the U.S. and advocates and lobbyists, but also our brothers and sisters in the other 11 countries. Well, except for those countries where you're not allowed to have any political freedom, like Vietnam and Brunei and Malaysia, where you go to jail, actually, for having a protest without a permit. But in the countries where it was possible, Chile, Peru, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Canada, et cetera. There's been a lot of great stuff. And actually in Malaysia, a bunch of people did do these great protests despite the threats. So um, all of that work meant that the agreement that Bush started in 2008, a lot of people don't remember this was, this was George W. Bush's agreement, wasn't doable in the schedule that was original, which was 2011. And in fact, you know, when they were trying to finish it in July of this year so they could still have a vote this year, before the election season really got crazy, they couldn't even make a final deal at the Maui ministerial that they held, which was, at that point, already two and a half years after their alleged last round of negotiations, they'd stopped any pretense of any public openness to it. They weren't telling the press the details, et cetera. So um, what they kind of realized was that the campaigning around the U.S., but in some of the other countries, was getting to a point where if they didn't get a deal soon, their ability to get a deal was going to really start to expire. So uh, something happened that no one expected. The U.S. actually backed down in some of the most totally cretinous things it was asking for. So, you know, if it was asking for 40 degrees below hell, they end up with 20 degrees below hell, but, um, which is still hell and hell and hell. But they backed up a little bit on some of their demands because they decided they better get a deal or they, maybe we're going to have the whole thing fall apart, which, again, it's just worth... It, we're all very bummed they got a deal, but it's worth everyone thinking about the fact that citizen activism around the world put them in that place, where actually some of the most extreme of the disgusting extreme demands that are being put forward, and not just the U.S., some of the other countries, on behalf of big corporate interests, got left in the curb, because in some other country, it had become just politically untenable because of citizen activism to accept that. Unfortunately, what we ended up with is still a really bad deal. Because, you know, before these last few things were agreed to, it was already 95% agreed, and the stuff that was agreed was really bad, and we know it's bad. So um, I'm going to bullet through what we know before they've released the text, because, yes, my friends, even though it's almost a month after they announced a final deal was reached, 
they have refused to release the text, not even to Congress. The only upside to this is some of the sort of past lovers of TPP in Congress are now starting to get really irritated because if you're like the chairman of the finance committee and you can't see the TPP text, it's a little irritating. And they're not letting Congress see it. They will release it at some point to both the advisory committees, which we know are dominated by corporate interests, and Congress. And then that's probably when they'll do that is when they give notice of intent to sign. There's a requirement that 90 days toll after that notice before they can actually sign it. That enters us into it, then it only goes into effect and starts to ruin our lives if Congress approves it, which is our next moment. Our first moment was to try and make sure the negotiations didn't happen. Our next moment was to try and make sure fast track didn't happen. The way the fast track fight was waged was really like a referendum on TPP. It was, are we going to have this vehicle to fast track into place TPP? So a lot of people around the country know more about it than they ever did. Most activists now, unlike you guys who remember, PDA folks knew, but like three years ago, if you said TPP, people thought, hmm, is that a new like superstore toilet paper plus? I mean, they had, they had no idea what TP anything stood for except the roll and the john. So three years later, people have an idea of what it is and that it's bad. A lot of activists know about the particular thing that's bad for them. Access to medicine folks know it would raise medicine prices. Internet freedom people know it would undermine access to information. Labor people know it would lower wages, bust union rights, and, and export more jobs. People who work on food safety issues and product safety issues know it will undermine safety standards. Environmentalists know it undermines climate policies. It's going to undermine the environment. Depending on your issue, you know that. But the mass American public, many people still, the polling shows, don't know what TPP is. And so the great news is the Fast Track campaign meant a lot of activists know, a lot of organizations know, and that's the base for the next phase of the campaign. Because now we have stage three, which is Congress and voting on TPP. When that can happen is somewhat set by the Fast Track schedule and some discretion by the administration. So the administration has the text. They are doing what they're calling a legal scrub. It's not really a legal scrub, because if that's all it took, it would be done by now. There are obviously parts that they mustn't have done and or they've decided given the clock is told so there's no chance they can have the vote this year. So you count back 90 days. If you wanted to have it on New Year's Eve, we're already out of 90 days. They would have had to have given notice to sign it to have a vote this year. So some people are speculating they're just going to sit on it for a while because why leave it out there smelling in the sun once it gets public. The first 30 days, only Congress and the advisory committees will have it. But after that, there's another 60 days where they have to post it. And there's already sort of a plan to do the analysis and make sure people actually know what it is. Because there's been a lot of baloney that's been spun by the administration. They're using the secrecy and holding on to the text to be able to try and set a narrative, a conventional wisdom. And there's some things that they say that are objectively knowable to not be true based on what we know about the text, which is where I'm going to close this presentation so you're all sort of uh, well briefed on what you ought to say back if someone says that kind of stuff to you about it. But before we get to that, the, the, the scenario for how this goes when Congress might vote on this is, first the agreement has to be signed, then there's some other things that have to happen, but that has to happen before there can be a vote. So given the 90 days notice, you cannot cut the corners around that. There are other things you might wangle around, but not the 90 days notice. So at a minimum, we know we're into the middle towards the end of January. But really, the window for a vote is probably after the Super Tuesday primaries. That is when the White House and the corporate lobby want it. They think doing it before that is just going to be a distraction. People won't be able to focus on it. They don't want it that injected in the presidential campaign. Um, when, when Secretary Clinton came out against TPP, with all of her caveats, it still was incredibly um, uh, it was a moment of incredible media focus. What is TPP? Why is she against it? How can she be against it? Look, they're all against it. And so they don't want more of that. They don't want the presidential to be more of that. So after Super Tuesday, so middle to end of March, beginning of April, is a window of peril when they want to do this. The corporate guys, the lobbyists think after that, people get into sort of just like presidential silly season. And it's going to be really hard to have a vote until maybe a lame duck session where the retired and the fired would get to come back. Now, the thing is, if TPP is made toxic enough, and if whoever is the president-elect by then has to say something about what they're going to do to change it, then that becomes a really dicey thing to have the voter, instead of letting the person who's about to become president who said they're going to fix it, fix it. 
And then there's just always the business of making sure the votes are there until it gets fixed. And I guess the punchline I want to let everyone know is that is something that's totally achievable. And that's, again, because of how fast track was done. And um, as everyone knows, I'm a total wonk about counting votes. And um, I believe I came to everyone here and said we could stop fast track and we have to keep the Democrats' yes vote below 15. If we go over 20, we're finished. And folks will notice that when we hit 21 Democrats, we started to suddenly see a surge of Republicans saying yes, be flipping sides, because they could do the count too. Once we get over 20 Republican Democrats and the reasons that happened, we can go back and talk about. But once we got to that, they knew they could wangle it through. But in the end, fast track, if everyone who we knew, we knew where everyone's vote was. And if everyone had shown up and voted, because there were a bunch of absences that day, some very important ones, it was right after the South Carolina massacre, so members had gone back to their districts in South Carolina, there were some folks who were sick, there was someone who was away for a school graduation of a grandchild. If all those folks had voted, the margin was five votes. Five vote difference. Now, the way that they made this deal, they pissed off at least five people who had voted yes for fast track. On the other hand, they may have gotten some folks who were no on fast track to become a yes. So the margin of the map is super tight, which is why we saw the president yesterday invite all 28 of those Democrats who voted yes on fast track up to the White House for a little chat about TPP. You can't see it. No one else gets to analyze it, but let me just tell you why you should be for it and want to do a news conference with me. And that's a little bit what we're up against. So that, that sort of gets us to the timing of what we need to do, which is the members are being asked to decide now. So your letter is super timely, and the very first thing that we all need to do when we see members of Congress, either at home, if we see them at events, or if we're up here, if we make calls, the very most important thing to do is, if, one of, if your member of Congress is one of those 28 House members, because this is going to be a House fight again, if your member of Congress is one of those 28 House members who said, yes, I'm fast track, then you need to say to them, we got it, we disagreed on that, but this text is not out. And at a minimum, I am asking you, do not take a position based on the representations, no matter how much you may love the president or the trade representative. Please, as your constituent, give me and my colleagues and our expert colleagues, the, the, the economists with the unions, the analysts from the Sierra Club and the farm groups and Doctors Without Borders and AARP, let us at least bring you some analysis and discuss it as your constituents, a different perspective of what this means for jobs and wages, what it means for medicine prices and access to medicines, what it means for food safety, what it means for buy local, what it means for climate, what it means for the environment. Give us, please, the courtesy of committing to us now. You will not take a position until we've had a chance to look at the text. You will get it 30 days before. We will need a little bit of time after you see it, and we can have a chat about it. So making sure those folks don't get wangled over on sight unseen and all kinds of promises is the first piece of business if you have one of those folks. And you can go to our website, tradewatch.org, the vote chart there. I'm sure everyone in this room knows exactly where their member voted because um, you're all up to your ears in it. But if, if you have blocked that, because <laughs> that might be if you are in one of those 28 districts, you might have blocked that. Um, and, and for anyone who's going to be seeing this on video or anyone else who you might send to our website, tradewatch.org, you can see where your member voted. Um, and if there's someone who has signed a bunch of the congressional letters that have happened since, you'll even see if they've signed on to letters about TPP, about what it has to or not has to have, according to their name and the voting chart. And then for the folks who did the right thing and vote against fast track, most people in this room would know who was a champion who did that right away and said, I w I'm a member of Congress. Of course, I want to preserve my constitutional authority over trade. Those folks you should call up and say, we're looking forward to talking to you when we get the TPP heartbreaking, heartbreaking that they made a deal based on what's in there now. Really depressing. But we all know that in the end, though we got a lot of Democrats to vote no, there were some who were slightly tougher customers. If your Democratic member voted no on fast track, but was not the easiest to come to that conclusion along the process, which is to say if your member of Congress was one of those people who had to have severe, severe doses of democracy, then I would recommend that you contact them with the same message that you have for the, tw the people whose members voted, which is, we know you're voting against fast track. God bless you. Thank you. It was the right thing to do. We don't know what your position is on TPP. You ho we hope you will join us in opposing it. Let us send you this one pager about what we know right now before the text comes out. But can we please agree to meet once the text is out? 